Welcome to Grapple Arts Radio. Hi, it's Stefan Casting. Today I'm really excited because I get to interview my friend and my teacher, Marcus Suarez, about the old days back in Rio at the Carlson Gracie Academy, which was the, the factory for a lot of the fighters that came out and that really defined what Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu was about. A lot of the guys that we've heard of came from there. So I'd like to start by asking Marcus, uh, what was your very first day in class like when you started? When did you start training and what was it like? Well, I started to train in 1970, uh, I believe in March 1970. And my uncle, Herman, he was a friend of Carson, Gracie. So he brought me to the school, introduced me to Carson to do one trial class. And was, you know, uh, love at the first sight. So I like everything there. I like the, the system. I like the Carson Grace style to teach. And, you know, the students, I feel at home. And anyway. Uh, so was it actually the, Carlson who gave you your first lesson? No, no. My first class, Carson used to have some guys used to help him to teach. Uh, his brother, Rocian Gracie, uh, that was uh, my first six classes was with him. And Hazel Gracie, Carson's brother, was there at the time too. And he had another two guys that used to help him to teach, Toninho and Walter. So anyway, I did the, my first six classes was just self-defense program and learn some really basic stuff, you know. And after six classes, Rocian told me, no, you can go to the big room now and start to train with the guys. So that's it. So... And I started, I was 13 years old, and I started to train only with the adults there. You know, Carson didn't have too many kids at the time. So, and anyway, I just, when I started, I was stopping to do my weight training. And I stopped to grow when I was 12 too, so I was, I was a big kid for 13 years old, you know, and very strong because I did weight training for two and a half years. So anyway, uh, the problem of strength was not a problem for me. Only the conditioning, specific condition for jiu-jitsu and also, of course, the techniques, you know? So when you started, you said your first six classes were just self-defense, but then when you got into the big adult class, was it still self-defense? How, how were those classes structured? You, you would come in and you would do what? No, the self-defense classes... Uh, was like a private class, right? Just me, sometimes me and somebody else with the instructor in the room. So, but that was the system they used to have at the, the Grace School at the time, right? So the student come, he learned first all the program of self-defense, and after that he jumped to the big room to start to train specific Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, take downs and fight on the ground. Yep. And so, would there be a warm up? Would you do exercises? Would you just come in, do some techniques, and then spar? Do you remember what the split was between sparring and technique training? No, no. The class was uh, very relaxed. Everybody come, they do his own warm up, you know. Sometimes people show techniques, sometimes go training right away, you know. And that's it. Okay. Um, so, the, the self defense was just sort of your introduction, and then they never really touched on that again? They never did it again? Is it is it fair to say that, uh, because at this time, Carlson's school was separate from Helio's school. Did, yes. Um, did they emphasize more self-defense at Helio's school? No. They, they teach the program for you. When you finish, you learn all the techniques. You start to practice the fight on the ground. That's it. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about the history of Carlson? I mean, he, he learned from his, from Carlos, his father, and he learned from Helio, 
his his uncle. Is that right? Yeah, Carlos was the oldest brother of the family, and he was the guy learning uh, from Count Coma, right? From my Maeda. Maeda. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, Car uh, Carlos is uh, when he learned later on, he started to teach to his young brothers too, and Helio was the youngest one. So, but anyway, uh, when they had the school in Brazil, uh, one day I think so, Carlos missed the class or came late, you know, and Helio was there, he was watching the class, then he decided to take care of the class. So he teach for the students, was there at that day, and it looks like he had a, a good talent to teach, you know, so the students like and from them, I think so, he started to, to teach the class there. And Carlos uh, started to take care more of the part of the, the, the food, you know. He was studying the, the, the Gracie diet. about the Gracie diet and all the stuff, you know. Separated the foods in different groups, you know. So he was spending a lot of time doing this and let Hilo and... The, the nephews the, and sons, you know, take care of the school. Okay. From, from what I've read and trying to put it together, Carlos Gracie, the, the oldest brother who first learned from Maeda, he really only had a couple of years of training under Maeda before he split off and opened his own school. Do you know that era? Is that a little bit before your, that's before your time, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, even, even my mother and my father was not born at that time, you know, so I don't have an idea very well, you know, how long he trained with Maeda, you know, and I, I never had this kind of conversation with, with Carson Gracie. And I met Carlos very briefly because, you know, I used to see him at the tournaments, you know, he was one guy who stayed more at home. You know, he only used to come to the tournaments to prestigiate the tournaments and be there, you know. So to, to, refer, to referee? or No, no, not to referee. He used to sit on the main table. Oh, guest of honor. Yes. Okay. So then when Carlson split off and opened his own school, um, did, he, he, did he open that by himself or did he open that with other people? Uh, I believe you, Carson, when he uh, he decided to open his own school, the first school he opened, I believe in 68, if I'm not wrong, he opened one school, but it didn't last too long, with Van Gomes, one of his uh, opponents, right? One guy fought him. They fought three times, three draws, and Carson was said Ivan Gomes was a really tough guy, you know. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, they had this school together for a while, and I believe in, in 69, end of 68 or 69, Carson opened his own school. And I started to train in 1970, so I was part of the first generation of the Carson Grace mm -hmm. team. And then, then later... Carlson and Halls taught together. Is that right? Yeah. Hall, Halls Gracie, the guy who's known as one of the best mm -hmm. of all time. So in 1970, when I start, Carlson was located at Avenida Copacabana 583. <laughs> you still remember, eh? Yes. And in, in the middle of nine, uh, 1974, he moved to the other school at Figueiredo Magalhães 414. So the school is still there, you know? So when Carson moved to this school at Figueiredo Magalhães, was when he started to split the, the club with halls, you know? Because we used to have one big room, and on the bottom uh, we had the... Uh, secretary there, you know, the uh, people re register and all the stuff, right? And we had two rooms for private classes or, you know, 
people warm up, something like that, you know. And Carson used to be in the main room every Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. And Hall's Grace on the bottom. And Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, Hall's go to the big room and Carson stay on the bottom. So did you get to train with Halls? Did you know him? Oh, yeah, of course. I met Rawls and, you know, used to be a while when we, we used to have the the trials to see who we're going to represent because at the time, Carson didn't use his name for the school, mm. right? So... You, you mean to go to the tournament to be the yes, official representative? We for used the to represent school. the Grace Academy, mm. right? So, anyway... Each weight category only allowed it to go two athletes. So, and sometimes we have uh, more than 10, even 20 guys in the same category. And only the two best was allowed to go to represent the team, you know. So, but anyway, you win this internal tournaments there was 10 times harder than win the, the main competition that we were, were supposed to go later, you know. So it'd be Carlson students fighting Carlson students and Hall's Exactly, students. exactly. Okay. And we used to have a big rivalry, but friendly rivalry, you know, okay. was good. Do you agree? I've heard lots of people say that Hall's was one of the absolute best um, fighters. Do you agree with that? What, what, what made him, well, maybe another way of asking that, what made him great? What was good about him? Hall's Grace was uh, a very creative fighter, you know? So he's the kind of guy, he fights on the mistakes of the opponent. He was not strong to do chokes, to do arm locks, to do this, to do that. He was good to uh, catch the mistake of the opponent and take advantage to submit him with his own mistake, you know? So... He was very good stand up. He decided to be a professional fighter. He started training judo. And I remember that at the time, uh, even the Brazilian soccer team, they only started to do physical condition training for the World Cup 1970. So you mean running and weightlifting yeah. and that sort of thing? Preparing to be in good shape, you know, specific conditioning for the kind of sport you're going to practice. And I remember me and Ross Grace was the first two guys of the school <laughs> we used to take care of this, you know, because I had the background in weightlifting, you know, so I started to run and, you know, I saw the athletes from water polo, they used to come to the school to train, they had very good condition, you know. I used to roll with the guys for one hour. The guys look f still fresh after one hour. And I said, oh, this look good. So I started to do <laughs> water polo also and rowing to train with the guys because they used to do a lot of conditioning too. So, and I thought, oh, maybe this is going to help my endurance here in the fight. And did it? Oh, yeah, of course. Mm. Well, I, I have to ask. Um, so did Carlson do any wrestling or boxing or judo or was it, was he pretty much pure jiu-jitsu? No, no, this school, we used to train only jiu-jitsu there. One of the students, uh, his name was Heitor Fernandes, he used to train with us and he was Argentinian guy and he was a box instructor. So every Saturday in the classes, he used to train the students of Carson a little bit of boxing too. But we didn't wear gloves, nothing like that, you know? More, you know, the techniques, and we used it to, to do open hands, you know, just slaps instead of punches. Mm -hmm. Now, was this the era of Valetudo? Was there, I mean, did you ever see Carlson fight? Uh, no, hold no, part? no. Uh, I never saw Carson fight because uh, at the time Carson did his last fight, I was too young and I also live in the northeast of Brazil for two years and a half. My stepfather moved to the northeast, you know, and of course, 
my whole family moved there too, you know, so I came back to Rio de Janeiro in, at the end of 67. So I, I live in the northeast of Brazil from the middle of 64 to the end of 67. So when you were training in jiu-jitsu, was a was valet tudo or no holds part a big part of why people wanted to do that? Why? No, when I started in 1970, uh, the valet tudo was prohibited in Brazil. They started to to have the first fights. You know, I was retired already because I stopped to compete in 1981 because. Your life changed, you know, so I started to do university and have a job and, you know, some injuries also. So I decided to stop to compete. And But they started the first Vale Tudos in Brazil, I believe it was in 1984. And when Hickson fought Zulu and started to have some fights, you know, in 1991 we had this big challenge in Rio jiu-jitsu against the luta livre guys, you know, so, and they start again after that in 93, I believe they started the UFC, you know, mm -hmm. and the thing started to grow again all over the world, in mm -hmm. Japan, uh, North America, Brazil started to have some tournaments again, and that's it. Well, what about um, challenge matches or guys coming in from the street, you know, tough guys who wanted to to try you guys out. Did that still happen, even though the, there was no formal Valley Tudor? Yeah. Uh, in the 70s, uh, the two uh, fight sports most popular in Brazil uh, was Judo and Karate. Karate was kind of brand new thing in Brazil, you know, so, and, you know, people, human beings, very curious, you know, so they start to go to try karate and, you know, some Japanese guys move to, to Brazil. And one of them was brother of the guy who used to organize the tournaments in Japan. And that's it, you know. But anyway, jiu-jitsu was a more, uh, for rich people, was a little bit maybe expensive for the... For the average Brazilian, person to pay for. Exactly, you know. So anyway, but once in a while, you know, people used to talk about jiu-jitsu and some guys come to the school just to challenge and try, you know. And Castro used to lock the doors and put the challenges to, to fight against us, you know. But we were not allowed to strike the guys, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and the guys could strike us. We just could dominate the guy, hold it, take the guy down, and do the submission very lightly. Carson didn't like we we hurt the guys, you know. So anyway, but I believe most of them, maybe ninety percent, <laughs> after they see the efficiency of jiu-jitsu, you know, they became students of the school. It actually seems like there's a lot of you know, times that students or opponents become students and also the other way around, students become opponents. I mean, some of Carlson's biggest fights were against former students of himself and of Helio. And... Yeah, you know, so, uh, and that's the reason Carlson created the, the slang in Brazil, we call the creonte. <laughs> <laughs> so when the guy leaves the school, you know, and... Who starts to fight against the the old friends. Where did that word come from? Oh man, this is a funny thing, you know. People in North America maybe don't understand very well, but in, in Brazil, many people like to watch soap operas. You know, it's very popular. So sometimes when you have a good one, the country stops. Everybody go watch this. You know. Anyway, one of the soap operas. One of the guy is a, was a really bad guy. His name was Creonte, you know. And Carson associated the, the, his name with this word Creonte and started to call the traitors and, you know, people do funny things like that with this nickname, you know. 
And it stuck. Is yeah, that a new word? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, you've been doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu for a long time. So how was how have you seen the sport evolve? Like, were there techniques that didn't exist when you started? What were some of the big ones that came in? And how has it how has it changed? I mean, that's a big question over over forty years. But mm-hmm. this is your chance. <laughs> so anyway, uh Things start to develop more when we have more minds thinking, you know? <laughs> so we have more options in different styles and, you know, everything. So I remember at the time when I started to train, uh, people don't use it to, to do uh, arm locks from the guard and triangle chokes, for example, right? or either homoplatas and, you know, some new stuff came a little later, you know. So anyway, uh, and it's good to be a long time involved in the sport because you can follow the evolution of the sports, how the new things came and how you have to readapt your techniques to pass the guard, for example, don't be vulnerable against the triangle chokes and, and I'm locked from the guide and whatever, right? So this little change is something funny that uh, make uh, people have more time, more experience in jiu-jitsu, you know, uh, the guys that follow the evolution of the sport. I think so they have more open-minded to understand the, the jiu-jitsu a little better. So you're saying in 1970, there was no triangle choke. It's now the signature, almost the signature move of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Exactly. People don't use it to do too much, you know. Strange. So, now, you had a, a friendly rivalry between Halls and Carlson at, at the same school, but of course there was also the other school, the, the Helios school in downtown Rio at the same time. Can you speak a little bit about the rivalry there? And also about the differences in emphasis of how they trained compared to how you guys trained, how they competed or fought compared to how you guys competed or fought? Look, uh, I don't know very well because I never been at the Helio Grace School in downtown, right? So at the time they didn't have this the this school they call the, the Grace School now at the, it's a private school in Brazil, you know, they have the Grace School there now. But at the time, they only used to have the school in downtown. And I never been there to train, you know. Carson used to take uh, me and the other students sometimes to train at different places, at João Alberto Academy, uh, with his brother Álvaro Barreto. Sometimes you go to Kyoto, uh, Francisco Mansur was the instructor there, you know. So we used to go to different schools, you know. Even at the Carson Grace School in Niterói, is the other side of the bay in Rio de Janeiro. We used to go there to train with his students there. And, you know, we used to always visit other schools to train, you know. Even sometimes go to Sao Paulo to compete and train with other people. And when you say train, you really mean to roll or to spar? No, to, to roll, exactly, you know. To see who's, basically to see who's the best. Yeah, <laughs> we go to do, to do what we know, you know. Okay. If the guy know a little less, you know. <laughs> they tap. <laughs> they tap, exactly. <laughs> okay. Um, so then the other big school, though. Grace School in Rio, right? The guys take care of the school. used to be Hickson Grace, Hoyler, and another brother. But Hickson moved to the States, you know. And Hoyler was in charge. Hoyler and Hooker Gracie was the two guys in charge to teach there when Hickson moved to the States. But they still have the school. Barra Gracie uh, came when Carlos Gracie Jr. was one of Rawls' students, you know. Soon as Rawls passed away in 1982, uh, so Carlos moved from Carson Grace School, decided to move to another neighborhood we call Barra da Tijuca, in Rio. 
And he opened the, the name Grace Barra because it's Barra da Tijuca, it's the name of the neighborhood there, right? Just see the location. Okay. So that's when it started Grace Barra. Okay. So then when you would meet the Gracie School and the Gracie Baja guys in tournament, was there a specific flavor? Like, could you tell who was from what school depending on how they were fighting? Yeah, Carson Gracie guys, they used to fight always on the top, you know. And even the other schools at the time, nobody used to jump to guard a long time ago, you know. The point system was a little bit different. So people come to the competition, they really come to try to submit the opponent, not to make points or advantages, you know. What I think makes the fights today very boring. I love to watch Jiu-Jitsu, but right now I don't have patience to go to one tournament and look people run away from the fight standing, jump to guard, you know, and try to do one little thing to get advantage and stall the fight. So, you know, so I think so is not a nice Jiu-Jitsu for people watch. So I believe the Jiu-Jitsu used to using the competitions in the 70s was way better, way more aggressive, you know, and more dynamic. Okay. Now, um, a lot of the big names in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu now, whether in just in Jiu-Jitsu or also in MMA, came from Carlson's, or Carlson's students. So why did Carlson have so many great students? What, what did he do differently? And and what was he best at? What was what was his? Why was he such a good teacher? Well, uh, I think so. Carson, uh, he was one guy that uh, he used to care a lot about the knowledge of his students. You know, so what I've heard, I, I don't know because I didn't go to the other Grace School to train. But I heard that they give more priority for better training only for the members of the family. So I don't know. And Carson used to train his students, you know, like everybody was his kids, you know. Looks like everybody was Carson Grace's son. So he gave it total attention to everybody and tried to correct the mistakes we used to do, you know. And I don't know. When you you teach like that, I believe that you start to have a, a group with very good knowledge, you know. Okay. It's my opinion. Okay. So then so then what happened in the big split when like Mario Sperry, Bustamante, Vitor Belfort, Laborio, they all there was a couple of years there where they all basically split off. No, this uh what happened, you know. Uh we are friends, everybody, you know, so Anyway, in, I believe in 96, Castro was invited to move to the States to open school, you know, 96 or 97, around that time, you know. I believe it was 96 because I came to Canada in 97. And before I, I, I moved here to Vancouver, I stopped at his school in, in LA to teach some classes there, stay, spend five days with him. But anyway, when Carson uh, moved to the States, you know, uh, the students, they used to start to compete in MMA. They felt a little bit disorientated because Carson was not there anymore to help with the training, you know. And anyway, Carson said he uh, used to go back to Brazil when the time of the fight was coming closer to help the guys with the training, or if the guys want, go to LA and train at his school there, you know, he would give total assistance for the fighters to help them to do a good show, you know, so anyway, so after that was a little bit of a misunderstanding about the agreement about the percentage of the purse of the fighters, something like that. So that's the reason 
they split, you know, because Carson moved away and they felt he wasn't giving too much attention, something like that, you know? Okay. Well, I mean, of course, Carlson passed away not that long ago, but um, if he were still around, could you give us some examples of who his favorite MMA fighters, or who his favorite jiu-jitsu fighters would be, and who his favorite MMA fighters would be today? Is there anybody who is competing that exemplifies that aggressive top style so in jiu-jitsu uh, Carson always talk about one of uh, his students old students you know and he used to be my training partner too Sergio Iris he was really really good you know and I remember when Hall's Grace started to to come to the Carson Grace school start to train with the guys there. So, Sergio uh, was in, in, in better shape than him, you know, so he used to dominate the training, you know, so Sergio was really good, one of the best guys I saw training Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you know. And after that, Carson had so many good students, it's hard to, you know, say one or two because we used to to go to the tournament, you know, and bring all the gold home, you know. And what's funny because the other Gracie schools, they used to put the teams together to try to beat us, and we always got the first place for three decades, you know. I think so was a very good job Carson did, you know. You dominated the scene for around 30 years, you know. It's not easy. Okay. Well, what about today, though? What about, like, in the UFC, in the UFC fighting today in 2011, are there any... Uh, when, when I spoke to Carson, Carson used to have a, a great admiration for Fedor, you know? So, like everybody else, you know, so... <laughs> He's a really good fighter, a complete fighter, you know? He's the kind of fighter don't run away from the fight. The fight is standing, his fight stand. Fight go to the ground, he go to the ground, you know. So that's what the fighter should do. Imagine if you go, you know, to the ballet and the guy gets tired, he stop to dance, you know. So <laughs> when you pay to do what you have to do, man, you have to be in good shape, you know. Imagine if you go to the opera, they sing, oh, I'm tired, I'm, you know, I cannot sing. So you pay to watch the guy do his job, you know. <laughs> that, that's beautiful. Um, well, I guess, um, I mean, there's a lot of people carrying Carlson's l legacy forward, but you're definitely one of them. Would you consider yourself, would you consider yourself in that uh, lineage, like uh, in terms of carrying forward the things that he taught you or the things that you learned while training with him? Yeah, I... I don't know. I think in martial arts, uh, the main things you should learn, you know, is about uh, respect, you know, about loyalty. So, and I'm very thankful what I learned with Carson Gracie, everything he did for me, you know, and I'm more than happy to represent his name. I was the founder of the Carson Gracie Team Canada. Uh, I have a letter of Carson Grace authorizing me to open school under his name, wherever I want, any part of the world, you know. So we used to be really good friends, you know, play racquetball at the beach together, you know, so, <laughs> and do many things. So anyway, uh, I don't know. I'm happy to, you know, be still member of the Carson Grace team. And today, I believe we don't have too many guys, even the old students, you know. Some people use their own names in the school, you know, but I still represent the Carson Grace team here, and I'm happy my team is very big and strong here in Canada. We have 12 representative schools in Canada, one in South Africa. And until I'm alive, I'm going to try to do my best to represent and keep the same level of jiu-jitsu that we used to have in Brazil. Well, that's that's awesome. Thank you, Marcus. I'm 
very glad that I actually met Carlson a few years ago when you brought him up to Canada. He is a, a very intense and yet charismatic uh, guy. And just anyone listening, if you want more information about Marcus, you can go to Marcus Soares, S O A R E S dot com, see all the contact information for him and his affiliate schools. So thanks again for the interview, Marcus. I really enjoyed it. Okay, it's my pleasure. To thank you very much for the opportunity and success for the grappling arts. <laughs>